and I'm whole. I'm whole, I'm well, I'm healed. I have a future. I have a design, I have a plan, I have a purpose. I'm whole. Thank God that He gives us the ability to fight battles. That He gives us the strength to fight battles, real battles. I, um, I think it's good sometimes just to, just to put hell on notice, just put the devil on notice that you may be fighting me. That's fine. That's his job. That's what he does. He clocks in every morning. He never misses a day of work. But can you with me join in worship? Just Maybe it is a hand clap. I know. For some, that's a lot. Others, maybe you want to jump. I don't know what you want to do. I've been around spinners, dancers, hoppers, chandelier hangers. I've been around it all. Maybe ours are a little weak. Don't jump on that. But whatever it is, if you this morning can honestly say, yeah, Pastor, I have, I have a battle. I, maybe I haven't shared it with anybody or maybe you have. But you have a legit battle, something really going on. A real battle that has real consequences if it goes the wrong way. Could you just let hell know this morning you're not quitting and that you're going to fight your battle with worship? So let's do that. Clap, d- jump, dance, whatever you want to do. Let's do that. Yeah, hell doesn't win. Hell doesn't get to win. You belong to the king. I remind the devil all the time, the game is rigged. Once I belong to him, all bets are off. I'm held in the hollow of his hand. You hear what I'm saying? And Jesus said, if you're in my father's hand, no one can pluck you out of my father's hand. Yeah. So the game is rigged. I already know I win. It may be shabby getting there at times. But when I cross the line, I'm, I win. I win. This will not defeat you. You will win. Amen? Amen. Thank you, worship team. Thank you all that uh, participate and, and show their heart and come to worship. This is why we come, to do business with Jesus. That's why you come to church, to do business with Jesus. Um. Our kids are dismissed. I'm looking around for, oh, Amy. You're dismissed with Amy. So, uh, kiddos, you're dismissed to go back. Thank you, teachers. Thank you, Amy, Teresa Hall, everybody who does so well, Barbie, all the others on Sundays. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Man, that's the quietest kids have ever left. Y'all can be noisy. You ever, you ever heard noisy kids leave a sanctuary before? We were at our old church, and somebody was, uh, a little boy was getting in trouble, and his mom was going to take him out and whip him. Back home, we whip. We, no, we whoop. And this boy was about to get in trouble, and it was right after worship like this. It was quiet. You know, everybody was being reverent and mindful, and the mom had had it with him. She was taking him out the back door, and he yells, pray for me. He yelled as loud as he could. <laughs> Power of prayer. <laughs> it's First Samuel chapter 22. I know you probably can quote it by now. First Samuel 22, 1 through 5. Hey, let me say, <coughs> we're gearing up for Easter. Can you believe we're just five weeks away from celebrating Resurrection Sunday? And um, the Lord, Hunter, you got that slide. I know I threw you off. Um, the slide, our theme this year is going to be still greater, still greater than, Uh, because no matter what we've been through, no matter what the church has been through for over 2,000 years, the resurrection of Jesus is still greater than anything we have faced or we will face. So we're going to celebrate that on resurrection morning, that whatever it is you're going through, because of the the work of Jesus on the cross, it is still greater uh, than anything you're facing. Next week, hopefully, 
We'll have your invite cards in for you to be able to start giving to friends and coworkers and family. It'll have a QR code on it, and they can just QR code that, and it'll take them right to our web page or our Facebook page so they can get more info about our Easter service. So, so looking forward uh, to that. It is our largest attendance service, so uh, we will have the 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock that day for, for Easter so that we won't be uh, jammed in so tight. 1 Samuel chapter 22, verses 1 through 5, and today with the help of the Holy Spirit, uh, we're going to get out of here, the cave. David therefore departed <coughs> from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. So when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him, and everyone who was in distress, and everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was discontented gathered to him. Wait, they super glued my water. Purified. <clears throat> yeah. So he became captain over them, <clears throat> and there were about 400 men with him. Then David went from there to Mizpah of Moab. He said to the king of Moab, <clears throat> please let my father and mother come here with you till I know what God will do for me. So he brought them before the king of Moab. They dwelt with him all the time that David was in the stronghold. And the prophet Gad said to David, do not stay in the stronghold, depart, go to the land of Judah. So David departed and went into the forest of Hereth. God, help me today to deliver your word. I pray, God, that you would move through my vocal cords and heal this congestion in my lungs, God, to be able to deliver your message today. Thank you for a patient people who wait to hear what the Lord would say. Speak to us collectively as a family today, God. Speak to those who are with us online, our online family, our extended family. Bless them, Lord, in whatever it is that they're going through. Remind them of who they belong to as well. Jesus, would you minister to our hearts, our minds, our souls, our spirits, that we be drawn closer to you than ever before, more than we could imagine. Change and challenge us at the same time, we pray, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I got one, but thank you. Thank you, Jim. <clears throat> My challenge today <clears throat> is going to be I have to keep a, a pretty uh, rhythmic pace. If I get all wound up, I'll just turn into a big coffin mess, and you all will say, Lord have mercy, let's go to Bob Evans. So I want to try to stay at a rhythmic pace <clears throat> so that I don't end up coughing all over you. We're looking um, in the cave again this morning, and we've watched David grow some roots in what I have termed to be the most unlikely place to think of that God would send somebody to grow. We've determined that we need to do some things in those cave moments of our lives, in those dark seasons, in those hard seasons where we feel like the walls are literally closing in around us. We've talked about moves or decisions or actions that we need to be mindful of to take in those cave moments. We talked about making sure, uh, first of all, that we paid attention to the attendance sheet in the cave. Um, I tried to hammer that home, that it is vitally important for you to take note of who joins you in the dark seasons. Who is it that the Lord has sent to you? That's not coincidental. That's not just because they didn't have anything else to do. There are people who listen to the voice of God They'll pray for you in times you don't even know they're praying for you. There are people in this room that God will wake up at 2, 3 a.m. in the morning to pray for you. And thank God they're faithful to pray. There are people that God will send to you when you're going through the worst battle of your life. <coughs> and after they have a conversation with you, you will wonder, how did they know what I was going through? Anybody ever live this? Am I just talking to the wall? All right. Somebody will come and say something to you and you'll say, that is exactly what I'm going through. Thank you for telling me that. Take notice of the attendance sheet 
of, of who is with you. Last week we talked about how that God spotlights our callings in the darkest of cave moments. And he does. He turns the spotlight on. There's moments of pressure. If you remember last week I used the ketchup bottle to describe that to you. There are times when things get shaken in our lives and there's times even when God still has to apply a little bit of pressure just to make sure that what's in us gets out of us. That there are moments where God has placed things in us that those around us need. And we didn't know why we were going through it or why we were doing it in that season, but it's in this season that we figure out that, oh, God was, God was teaching me something. I used the Karate Kid illustration last week. When Daniel was having to paint the fence and he didn't understand why until Mr. Miyagi was putting some offense on him and he said, now paint the fence. And he found out, oh, I was learning defense the whole time I was painting the fence. There's things that God will do in your life and do in my life that are just teaching us for further seasons. And God rearranges relationships in those dark moments. There's some shifting that takes place. If you go to a play, uh, you'll find that when they close the curtain and it's dark in the room, you can't see what's happening behind the curtain. But when the curtain rises back up, there's different characters on the stage and different scenery. And there's times in the dark moments of your life, you don't see it all, but God is rearranging not just environments, but God does rearrange relationships. And when the spotlight kicks back on, the people you thought were going to be with you are no longer with you. And the people you didn't expect to be next to you are the people who are now next to you. God doesn't do it when we can see it because we whine about it. He does it in the dark times so that we know that he knows what he's doing. I used the illustration out of David's story of when he went to the king of Moab, which should have hated David because David was an Israelite and they were at war. But God had worked it all out. David didn't even know it because David's great-grandma, Ruth, was a Moabite. And he had a connection with the king of Moab that he didn't understand even the depth of. But God did. That in the moment, he would need that connection. And now I want to look at the last piece of David's cave story. It's fitting uh, that we're looking at this piece, and I, I, I kind of understand now why God prolonged the message. Again, I didn't know why that kept happening, but every week has brought something new to each of these points. And I'm, I'm thankful God slows us down sometime, even when we don't know we need slowed down. It's fitting to me that we're talking about this on the first day of spring. On the first day of spring. All of you people who despise winter, you should have been dancing up the aisles today without even music. It is the first day of spring. In fact, it is official, it was official at 11.33 this morning. While you were in worship, winter died. What about that? <laughs> He'll be back. At 11.33 this morning, winter died. Spring is seen as a transition. It's coming from dark and cold of winter into the brightness and the newness of the life of spring. You're moving into a noticeable season. The things are going to start growing and blossoming and blooming and new life is going to be all around you. That's why people love spring. Temperatures begin to warm up where you have 70 degree days and you leave your windows open and the breeze just blows through your house. Can I get an amen? I know why y'all like it. But there's green and there's new and there's life. In fact, if you, if you notice, most farm animals and forest animals give birth to their babies in spring. In fact, that's why most Easter cards have all these little babies on them. They're just so cute. Little lamb and, you know, little chick and they're never cute. But little rabbits and all those, all those little babies are so pretty. And they're all born in spring. In fact, three to one babies are born in springtime on the farm and in the forest. And why? Why is that? Why would God set it that way? Because they're coming out of winter. And scientifically, the vegetation that begins to grow in spring is full of more nutrients than any other time of the year. And get this, the vegetation that begins to grow in early spring is more digestible than at any other time of the year. And so nature itself, because God's fingerprint is on it, knows when to give birth to something new because it is in that season 
that the most strength is available to them and it's the easiest digestible for them to be able to make it into the summer and the fall and the winter seasons that are coming. It also means that the days are getting longer. And so animals have longer to try to find food during the daylight hours before the nocturnal predators come out at night. And so spring is the perfect time for something new to be born. And isn't it just like God to know that when we're coming out of our darkest and coldest seasons, we're going to need the season that offers the most light and the season that offers the most strength. It's funny to me that God would set that into nature because it's just as true in our spiritual lives. Let me testify a moment. There are going to be dark times. If you're new to the faith, let me go ahead and upset your apple cart. You're not going to fly on a magic carpet over rainbows your whole life. There's going to be times when you feel like you're walking through volcanoes and deserts and rocky places and places filled with scorpions. And I'm getting wound up. My lungs are letting me know. There's going to be times when you feel like pressure is coming and weight is coming on you. That's just how life is. It doesn't mean that you've done something wrong. It doesn't mean that you're not favored. It doesn't mean that God doesn't love you. There are legit stormy seasons that you're going to have to walk through. But let me give you some good gospel news this morning. The Holy Spirit is so good and Jesus is so faithful that when you've walked through the worst stormy dark times of your life, the sun always rises after the darkest of the night. Jesus doesn't leave us in the dark. He always brings us back to the light. And you'll find that when you're barely crawling out of that dark season, whatever it was, whatever it was that just broke your heart, you'll find that Jesus has prepared for you the digestible food that give you the nutrients and strength you need to accomplish what's right ahead of you. Look for it. You're like that newborn baby. You're cute as a little baby rabbit. And God has that placed right out in front of you. Here's the point that I'm going to hammer home today. The last thing you got to make sure of, when you come out of the cave, all of you has to exit. When you come out of the cave, all of you has to exit. Can you testify to this to me? You can physically be somewhere and your mind be a hundred miles away. Really? Me too. You ever sit in a class and somebody's super, super educated? I mean, they know their stuff, and they're musing greatly about algebraic equations and popular theory of cross-culturism. And you're listening to them, and your phone goes off. <laughs> you're listening to them, and maybe somebody's phone, phone does go off, and it's that Caribbean Calypso ringtone. Dun, 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 dun. And while they're going on about the beauties of algebra, you're on the beach somewhere. And the, and the professor goes, find X. And you have, I have no idea where X is. All I know is this beach is wonderful. You're in the classroom, but your mind is somewhere else. The biggest challenge to getting out of cave seasons, the biggest challenge, the one you will have the most issue with is you. Is you. We don't talk about it much because we like to pick apart everybody else. But what about you? What are you enduring during the dressing room of the cave? People for the last few weeks have been talking about World War III. What about World War Me? What about when I don't know what I'm doing? And I see everybody else running laps and I'm stuck on the bench. Because I'm unsure of where I should go. Listen to me. Moving forward does not require that you're flawless. But it does require you to be free. I'm not asking you to be perfect. I'm asking you to be free. Your mind has to be freed from the cave. Listen, I get it. There are circumstances, there are seasons that remind us that we're frail. There are things that happen in our lives that remind us that we're broken. But even in those frail and broken moments, and you may not understand what I'm saying. I hope you do. Even in those frail and broken moments when you're brought face-to-face -face with, the, with the exact truth that you are not perfect, 
even in those moments, you need to be able to stand flat-footed and say, but I am free. Say, Pastor, how in the world can I say that? Because Jesus said it. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. You say, yeah, but I just failed. If you knew what I did with him, if you knew what I did with her, if you knew what I did with that crowd, if you knew where I was last Saturday, if you know what I did last Friday, you're frail, you're broken, you are full of the potential to sin. I get it. But you need to be able to stand and say, but I am free because he has made me free. I'm free because he has made me free. The monster that is the strongest one for you to hold on to is you. I want you to look at how David lets us in on this clue. He begins to refer to the cave as a stronghold. Did you catch that? 1 Samuel 22, look at, look at it again with me. It's verse 4. So he brought, with, he brought them before the king of Moab, and they dwelt with him all the time that David was in the what? Stronghold. Up until that point, he called it a cave. But now the cave has become a stronghold. The cave where you were going to be changed into what God wanted you to be, you've stayed too long and now it's become a stronghold. It's become a place that won't let you go. Now here's the funny thing is David is outside the cave. He's talking to the king of Moab. He's not even in the dark place. But it tells us where his mind is. It's still in the stronghold of the cave. David walks out of the cave it's a stronghold. It's a, it's a hold. A cave in the Hebrew language is mihara. It means a dark den. But he calls it a matsud. He changes the name from mahara to matsud. So it goes from being a dark den to, you know what matsud means? A snare or a net that I'm unable to escape from. Oh, that's important. David said, I thought it was just a dark season. I thought it was just a dark place. I thought it was just where God was going to change some things and get me ready. But I've become so familiar with the dark that now it's a place I can't get out of. And in mine and your life, it, I'm telling you the honest truth. There are trials and storms and hurts and relationships that leave you brokenhearted and people that you thought would be there are not there and you will fess up and say, Pastor, it is a dark time. I've been through a dark season. But even after Jesus sets you free, your mind can stay stuck in the net of that darkness. And you relive the hurt and you relive the, the false expectations and you relive all of the abandonment and you relive all of the scar and the wound and the gash over and over and over. And you still go to work and you still go to school and you still go to family functions and you still go to the Walmart. And people say, well, you should be better. I mean, I see you out and about. But truth be told, I may be out and about, but my mind is still stuck in a net of my hurt. And David says, this is, this is where I'm living. I'm physically out of the cave, but my mind is in a stronghold. Even though God was putting together this beautiful, beautiful puzzle, David's still holding on to a couple pieces in his fingers and saying, this absolutely makes no sense. Why am I going through this? There are detours that arrived that we didn't know and we didn't see were coming because they were planned on the road before we left the driveway. And we couldn't see them until we were in the moment of those detours. And we have a place we're wanting to get to. And we have a preferred route that we want to take to get there. Because we're sure that's the best route we need to take. But the destination may still be the destination. But God reserves the right to detour us out of our expected route. To take us on the route he knows we really need to take. When I leave my house and I'm going to uh, Bridge Street. I go this way. Yes, I go this way toward Veterans Parkway and cut over. Anybody else take that route? I don't want to take that way. I don't want to take that way. I don't want to go through downtown. I don't want red lights and stop signs and people running out in front of me. I don't want all that. I like to go over here on Veterans Parkway, hit 35. Anybody with me on that? But do you know that I was driving the other day and got almost to Veterans Parkway and I didn't know they were working on whatever they were working on and it was a detour. I don't like that. It wasn't just a detour. It's like, you, no, you, nope, you ain't coming here. You got to go back the other way. Oh, are you serious? 
because I got it all figured out. That adds seven minutes to my drive. You hear the Armageddon language? Seven minutes to my drive into the world. And the whole way I'm driving down that way that I don't want to go, every stop sign, I'm mad. Every red light, and I catch them all, ain't one green. I catch them every red light, I'm mad. Even when it turns green, there's somebody crossing the road late on Water Street. I got a green light. I should be able to go. But they cross and a little book told me they have right away. And they're the slowest crosser in the world. But they're happy about it as they step off. I see a red hand on their sign going, uh-uh, 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 uh-uh. And they walk, and there I am with my thumbs on the steering wheel with a green light, and they go. And my Christianity is tested. Because the horn is right there calling to me, push me, push me. And instead, I raise my hand and go, (laughs) in my fury, I realize I know this person. (laughs) And I roll my window down, hi, Pastor Sean, hey. So good to see you while they're crossing the crosswalk. And now people behind me are blowing the horn. Pray for my mom. I will. We just found out she has brain cancer. (sighs) Yeah, I felt like that. Can you imagine how bad that would have went if I went, Ah, move it, lady. (laughs) No. Thank God the horn did not win the war. But that detour, (coughs) I needed. She needed the detour. God, they were already working on the road before I ever left the house. God knew what I needed before I knew what I needed. Detours from heaven are divine. We get mad about them, but... It may be the direction exactly that you needed to go. It doesn't sound like a big deal to say, well, you know, it's it's just a detour. But detours, detours can be can be God's best plans. Deuteronomy 1 2 says, It is an eleven days journey from Horeb by Mount Seir to Kadesh Barna. And it doesn't sound like a lot when you read it until you realize what he's talking about. When Israel leaves Egypt to go to the promised land, those are those two areas. It takes 11 days. How long did it take our our crew? 40 years. Hear what I'm saying? An 11-day trip took 40 years. I don't care who you're with, ain't nobody that bad of a driver. Ain't nobody. You know why it took 40 years? Because it goes on to say, but God did not lead them by that way. Why didn't he lead them by that way? Because God knew there were things in them that needed to get out of them. And if I had took you the 11-day journey, you would have ended up in the promised land and brought poison to it because the you that you are now won't fit the promise I have for you over here. So I'm going to take you this way. Oh, you're still going there, but I'm going to take you this way and this way and this way because there's going to be things that need shook off of you at Jericho, some things that need shook off of you at Ai, some things that need shook off of you at Zedek, some things that shook off of you over here in Basham. And if I don't shake it off over here and shake it off over here and shake it off over here, then when you get over there, you will ruin the very thing I made for you way back here. And so the detour was looked at as something I don't want to go through, but God said, I don't care if you want to, you got to go through the detour to get to where it is you're going. It's not about getting there first. It's not about getting there quicker. It's about arriving the best that you were designed to be. That's why anytime you're watching a movie and they say, hey, follow me, I know a shortcut, don't do it. Shortcuts lead to death. 
especially in scary movies. Follow me, shortcut. The last scary movie Andy and I watched was Wrong Turn. It was a long time ago. And I hesitate to drive through West Virginia yet today. But it all started because the girl in the car said, I know a shortcut. No, hush. We, don't, we stay on highways. Don't know a shortcut. The only place shortcuts work was Bo and Luke Duke. Anybody remember the Dukes of Hazard? It's the only place it worked. They, I, uh, Bo, take a shortcut. Where? There's a creek up ahead with an abandoned bridge that's broke halfway off. Really? Yeah. Here come Roscoe Pico train. Anybody remember the show I'm talking about? <laughs> Flash? Roscoe Pico train? Chasing them. Oh, boss, I got them Duke boys. They would head down over the creek, and sure enough, there was a bridge there. Broke just half off, perfect for the General Lee. And as it would go up, and come right over the thing. And by the time Roscoe Pico train got up there, wasn't no car. Shortcut. But you ain't the Duke boys. <laughs> this is life. We got a bad boss hog after us. A shortcut ain't the same as a detour. There ain't no shortcut to developing and maturing your calling in God. We've said we want to be trailblazers. We want to do kingdom work like no other generation before us. And yet we complain when things like COVID come along, when it could be a detour. God has shook stuff out of us that we didn't need to get to where we need to be. One of the challenges in our mindset wants to remain in what's comfortable because it's more controllable. Hear what I said? We want to be comfortable because it's controllable. God, make me uncomfortable so that I don't have the controller, but you have the controller. We'd rather stay in proximity to devils we're used to than in new seasons with a God we don't know what he's doing. And that will be our detriment. God, take me on the detour. I've used Joe Burrow before. Let me use him again. I'll put a pen in here and say something. In 2020, he had a knee injury that resulted in him having to have knee reconstructive surgery. I'm preaching, JP. And that one hit him. It caused him to miss what was supposed to be his season. <coughs> Joe Burrow came back after surgery. ESPN analyst said he was getting stronger. Why? Because he'd done something different. He began adding extra weights to his strength training. And when they interviewed him on Sports Illustrated, I want you to hear what he said. He said, I'm adding extra weight strength training because, here it is, quote, I know I'm going to get hit again. I'm taking the time to prepare now for the hit that will come then. My knee will be tougher with scar tissue. Here it is. But I want all of me to be just as tough as my knee. I'm not just preparing my body for the next hit. My mind needs to know how to take the next hit. Woo! Preach boy from Athens. He was laying it down. He was saying, I don't want just a strong knee that's fake. I want all of me to be strong, including my mind. So that when the next linebacker takes me out like a freight train, my mind is prepared to say, you've been through this before, and you'll get up and go through it again. And what did it do for Joe Burrow? He led a little team from Cincinnati to the Super Bowl because he knew this is what I have to do in my life. Listen to this. He ended up at the Super Bowl, but in his season back, last season, he made it to the Super Bowl with over 50 sacks in that season, the most in NFL history. Woo, doggies. He got hit more than any quarterback in NFL history and still led a team to the Super Bowl. Why? Because in the detour, he made sure his mind was just as strong as his knee and that the rest of his body was ready for the hit. Y'all, I am telling you, right now in the detour of your life, don't just, don't just say, well, I'll be okay. I I'll make it. I'll be. No, take this time to dig into God's Word. Fast, pray, get closer to God and say, what? When I come out of this cave, I'm going to get hit again and again and again. But I want the devil to know when he hits me, you're not hitting some man be pan but you're hitting somebody who has spent time in the word and knows that greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world I'm going to make it on through there's a double front line going on the fight that goes on in here and the fight that goes on out there 
And so much of our culture right now is tailored to tell us that we've got to make sure everybody out there knows every move of our life. That's what social media is about, ain't it? So everybody out there knows everything going on. What I eat, where I go, who I like, who I don't like, it's all on blast. You know why I think that's a trick of the enemy? Because as long as we keep appearances looking good out here, we never have to deal with what's in here. As long as I get thumbs up, likes, loves, and follows, I don't have to ever deal with what's really going on in here. And what's really going on in here is you may be wearing a different jersey than what you're wearing out here. And those people that like, follow, and love, when you're about to lose your mind, they're nowhere to be found. But the people who know you, the people who say, I know you're going through this, and I'm with you, they don't care if your social media is a mess. They're after you. I'm hurrying. David said, I want to know what the Lord will do for me. I want to know the real thing that the Lord will do for me. It's the word yada. To know not in theory, <laughs> but with undeniable evidence. When God does something for you, no counterfeit will work. It's tasting the real thing and knowing a knockoff. God brought a, brought a messenger, and I'm, I'm heading toward closing. God brought a messenger, the prophet Gad. Someone with a word from God. Look what he said. Gad said to David, do not stay in the stronghold. Depart and go to the land of Judah. I love this. God knew David had switched from calling it a cave to a stronghold, so he sent a messenger not to call it a cave, but to call it exactly what it was. Thank God for people in your life who can put a label on what you're facing. Get out of the stronghold, David, and go to the land of Judah. Y'all are church people. You know what that means, right? Praise. Go to the land of praise. You hear what he's saying? David, you got to get out of this net. And the only way you can get out of a net is to get into praise. Praise destroys the net. you got to relocate. Let me read you the scripture. 2 Corinthians 10. Here, Paul picks up on it. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. You know this. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. For pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing in every thought into the captivity of the obedience of Christ. There it is. How do you get out of the cave? Bring every thought into the obedience of Christ and praise your way through that. I love the war language because that means, that means there are people who are left over from past wars you've had in your mind. They're left over as occupiers. They're left over as squatters. Every battle you fought, those voices hang on in your mind. Some are for you and some are against you. Some want what God wants and some want what you want. And, and Paul said, you've got to be able to take those into captivity. To what? To the obedience of Christ. Meaning what? What God wants for me are the voices I will align with. How are you going to know? Praise. Every time you get into praise, you've been a real good praise server. Every time you get into praise, you are exhaling all that toxicity and you're inhaling God. <sighs> you begin to hear words like, this is how I fight my battles. And you align those thoughts. You, you hear words in praise like, all my life I have lived in the goodness of God. And you begin to align your thought processes to that. They about killed me, but God was still good. It's, it's aligning your thought process. And when that hits, when that activates, um, anybody like popcorn? Three of us? I love popcorn. I love it. I like, I, I do like microwave popcorn. I'm not sure what all poison I'm getting out of that, but I do like it. But I like popcorn in the, in the popper that we have. We hardly ever do it because it takes so long. But the popper we have where it's got the little arm spins around and you put oil in it. Anybody else ever do that? What is it? Yep. What she said. Whir whirl pop? Whirly pop. Yeah. 
And back home in Kentucky, you used to get a wrought iron skillet, and Mamma would heat it up real hot with oil, and we'd drop kernels in it. And she'd take a wood spoon and just keep doing this. But I, I'm fast. It don't take much to impress me. I can watch a whirly popper for a long time. And I watch that little arm go around. We put those kernels in there and that oil. And as it heats up, what do those kernels start doing? They start sizzling, bubbling. You ever seen it? That ain't cool. And all those kernels are getting the same heat, same oil, same arm. But every now and then, one kernel just looks at all the others and goes, I'm tired of this. You know, always the first one. And then there's a bunch of copiers, usually around him. Well, if he's going to do it. And it's so cool because once they get on track, it's. There's filling up. And if you leave it in there too long, they'll scorch. So you got to unplug it. You turn it over. You never thought you was going to get a lesson on popcorn this one, did you? You turn it over. And inevitably, in the bottom of your bowl, you will have 500 popped kernels, but there's always about 15 who just went, no. I don't care if all of them around me pop. <laughs> I see that as a church service. Yeah, popcorn preaches to me. In your life, there will be times when it, you and everybody around you is going through the same problems, the same struggles, the same heat. People get on TV talking about inflation like they're the only one God. We're all paying more. People get on TV talking about, well, you know, I did, people just don't care about my community. All of our communities are hurting. Well, we, people don't care about my family. My, my daughter's sick. We all got sick family members. We're all in the same oil. We're all with the same arm. We're being told we're not, but we are. We're all going through the same struggle, the same heat, the same oil. But somewhere, that Holy Spirit inside of you has to say, if nobody else is going to do it, I will. And, and people look and say, what is going on with you? Why would you be so happy? Haven't you noticed the world's falling apart? I know. Ain't it great? Ain't it great? Yes, God is here. God is with me. I'm going to pop when it's dark and pop when it's light. I'm going to pop when it's loud and pop when it's quiet. I'm going to pop when I'm sick and pop when I'm well. But that doesn't make any sense. Welcome to the kingdom of God. It doesn't make any sense. All I know is that I will not quit the one who never quit on me. I'm going to pop. So look at the person next to you and say, "Just, I mean, it's maybe dangerous. I'm just labeled to pop. I got to quit. <coughs> I got to pop. I'm going to pop. Mason, you're a popper. Mason rode with me down to Kentucky to some of those holler churches I used to preach at. You remember that? First of all, he thought I was just leading him out in the woods to kill him. He said, is there a church out here? I said, yes. <laughs> Just hold on, brother. And we finally got to the church. <clears throat> now, you saw the popping. Some people pop, some people don't. Mason, I could always count on him to be a, an early popper. I read the scripture. Here. Yes, pastor. See, he already popped. And what that does, it calls all the other colonels say, what's, what's, what am I missing? He just read a scripture. Mason got excited about the word of God for he ever heard the first point. Because he knew what was coming. What? God was going to talk. Those hill people popped more when Mason was there than when he wasn't with me. I mean, I had to work up a sweat. My tongue hanging down, preach my socks off to get a burp out of them. But when Mason was with me, he started early. Preach, pastor. Yes, yes. And those people I never heard nothing out of. Amen. Amen. They like it. They even stood up with a handkerchief. Amen. That's right. I needed Mason all my life because he's an early popper. When you're fighting the battles of in cave, out of cave, 
you don't only need to decide to be a pauper and surround yourself with paupers, but you've got to determine that you're going to encourage other people how to live out of the cave. Did you know that apples, you come to music, please, so thank you so much. Apples... I love apples. Anybody else love apples? I talk a lot about food today. Apple trees, <coughs> apple trees are called cross-pollinator trees. Meaning that if you want good, healthy apples. Now, a tree, an apple tree will produce apples. Yes, they'll bloom, they'll blossom. They'll produce from cross-pollinization of wind and bees. But if you want real strong, healthy apples, the best thing to do is to plant two apple trees in close proximity. Why? Because God designed them that way. So that when the wind ain't blowing and the bees ain't buzzing, those two trees, if they're close enough, they will pollinate each other. See where I'm going? Maybe we don't have the fruit we need to see in the church because we stop pollinating each other. Because we distanced ourselves from each other. Uh, I, I, I need help with this. Where'd Major go? In the nursery. Gotcha. Okay. Give me uh, Barry. Come on up. Japheth, come on up. You both are apple trees, okay? You're my favorite. Golden delicious trees. Okay? You're just golden delicious. Put your branches up. Come up here so everybody can see you. Ain't fair. They'll get, they'll get crook neck. All right. But I want you, I planted y'all, okay? Put your branches up. Lean your branches toward each other. You know how they go. All right. I walk out around my orchard. If, there, if, if it's not windy, if, if I've, I've killed every bee around, this is still working because they're, they're, do, they're doing the encouragement. Right? So it ain't a windy day, ain't, ain't a bee day. This tree, this Japheth tree, can look at the berry tree and say, it's all right, it's all right, berry tree. You're doing good. Your branches look awesome, man. I'm privileged to be planted by you. You're my brother. I've known you since a sprout. God's doing great things in your life. And what's that do? That makes berry... And then Barry will look at Japheth when he ain't had no bees visiting him for a while and say, hey, don't, don't get down. You don't need a bee. You got me. You got a friend in me. You got a friend in me. Now, when I come out in my orchard, I'm blessed. Why? Because my trees are talking. Praise God. Get going. But. Barry, would you move over by that banister? And Japheth, you move over by that banister. Over by that go-up banister. Yep. All right. Put your branches up. A little bit harder now, ain't it? To encourage. Because now the Japheth tree has to say, Yo, Barry! Are you blessed? Got to shout it. Got to holler it. Takes more energy. And he can't see the detail. Watch. He can't see the detail if Barry's developed a cut or a wound. I can't speak to that now. And Barry may not feel comfortable shouting all across the orchard, I got hurt. So he'll hide it. And he'll begin to defect in birth. He can't produce. And Japheth says, I don't know what's wrong with you. Come on, live it up. And Barry says, I'm trying. Now, put culture in between. Come on, Cole, Josh, Ben. Come on, Lydia. I want you to just stand in between the two trees. Come on, Bethany, Amaya, Taylor, Laney, Jacob. Come on, just stand in between the two trees. Yeah, just in a line. Right on. Jerry, go on up and help him. Salisa, go up and help him. Just stand in that line. Yeah. Your culture, okay? 
Do you know what you demand, culture? You demand apples. I don't know why the church ain't doing this. I don't know why the church ain't doing that. I don't know why the church saying this. I don't know why the church saying that. The world hates us but wants what we got. It puts them in a bad spot because we don't bow to their whim of what they want to do. They want us to bow to them, but we were planted long before culture got here. Here's the problem. I want all of you to just turn to the people next to you and just start talking. Just talk normal. Just about, I don't know, talk about basketball, talk about whatever. Talk about Russia, talk about Ukraine, talk about Biden, talk about Trump. Just talk about it all. Okay? Just talk. Sean's playing. Okay, now, these are the mainline culture. Just keep talking. We're backup culture. We're the people that watch the news get mad about people who get paid to make us mad. Okay? Now you talk to the people next to you. Just start talking. Yeah, go ahead. You're allowed to. Yeah, interrupt my message. Just talk. Japheth, encourage Barry. Barry, encourage Jacob. Japheth, encourage each other. Barry and Japheth, keep talking. Everybody else, shh. Everybody out here, hush. Everybody up here, hush. Japheth, Barry, keep talking. Okay, they were doing that the whole time, but we couldn't hear them. You know the sad part? They couldn't hear. All they could hear was whatever culture was closest to them. That wasn't talking anything about fruit or encouragement. What we've got to redo, come on, Barry Tree, come on, Japheth Tree, is on purpose plant ourselves next to each other again. Because you all start talking again, and you all start talking again, no matter who's talking what, now I can encourage you and you can encourage me. Don't buy into the lies of the world that somehow we don't have something to say. We do. Here's where we've misplaced it as a church. We've thought our first priority was to say something to them. Our first priority was to say something to us. So that before I talk to them, I make sure my brother has plenty of apples on his limbs. And I've got plenty of apples on my, y'all can be seated. Thank you. Sorry, Ben. Every fruit you produce, all three of these apples, yes, they're apples, but they all three taste different. We produce fruit that's different. There's things that God's going to use you to do that he won't use him to do. You don't worry over how she's doing it versus how you're doing it. You celebrate that both of you are passing out apples. My favorite is this yellow. I eat the whole thing. Just <laughs> Granny Smith, I got to work at that one. Woo. There's times people are going to bring you Granny Smith fruit. It's going to be tart and set your teeth on edge. But you still need it. Ready, babe? Come on. Come on. Woo! One, two, three. Now juggle them. No, just juggle them. All right. <laughs> Cross pollinate. I'm going to let you go. Pastor, I hear what you're saying. I think it's beautiful. I want to do that, but. My tree is so damaged, I don't even know that I could pollinate anybody. I get that. You might be this tree. Put up that last tree I gave you, Hunter. Sequoia. You've been around a while. Sequoia trees live for at least 3,500 years and grow to over 340 foot tall. That's a big tree. But do you know the only way, the only way sequoia trees can grow? Next slide. They drop cones. They drop male and female cones, and only female cones can reproduce. The ones that are female cones are the ones that, <coughs> like up here, the one at the very top. You see the little white stuff all around there? Those are seed spores. The male cones are the ones like all the way over on that side that don't have any. 
but they have to be together. This is so cool. The only way a sequoia cone can release its seed is through the extreme heat of wildfires. If it just lays on the ground, it doesn't produce because the cone is so hard. It takes the irregularity of fire to dry the cone enough to crack the cone. If it wasn't for fires, California wouldn't have sequoias. The reason it needs the male cone next to the female cone is because as they both get intense heat, the male cone will crack first and provide the release of heat needed so that the female cone will release the spores. Ain't that cool? I mean, that's cooler on the other side of the pillow. Which tells me that the sturdiest of people, the strongest of people, the people that are noticeable, somewhere in their story, if you'll sit down with them, they've got an unexpected wildfire that released the presence of God somewhere in their life. And they'll tell you, oh, it was bad. But in the middle of that storm, God cracked something open on the inside of me. I had to, I, I had to go through the fire to find his life. Mm, mm. That is Campbell Soup's good. Mm-mm, good. The fire you're in right now, hell don't control. You say, Pastor, it's hot, it's heated, I don't understand it. I'm getting dry in these places. I want you just to change your perspective, change your mindset. It may be that in the middle of this fire, God's cracking something open to release life. And if the end result is I can produce something that will stand for years for my kids to get shade from, then I'll go through the fire. I'll crack in the fire to release the life. Amen. I know when I said that, everybody's like, I don't know if that's true. Google it. I saw on History Channel, so if it's wrong, History Channel needs to go off. I'm sorry, not History, <laughs> National Geographic. Yeah, I'm a nerd. I watch all that because I get sermon stuff out of it. Release, unpack in the fire. This morning, if you don't know Jesus, and if you're watching online you don't know Jesus, I've preached my guts out to you. I want you to know him. I want you to know him like David knew him. I know the Lord will work for me. If you want that relationship with God, if you have that relationship with God that will draw you into a walk with him, that will draw you into a place that you can get on board and follow after him. Everything I preach about on Sundays, you say, I just don't know if God will do that for me. He will do that for you. You've got to surrender to him. So please, this morning, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, come on. What are you waiting on? Just waiting on life to get better. Life ain't getting better. Jesus is good even when life ain't good. Come on. Surrender to him this morning. Do it right. Live life right. Say, so who are you to tell me what's right? I'm not. He is. He's got a right way to do life. I want to live it. Doesn't make me better than you. It makes me following one who's faithful, not stuck in a life that's comfortable. Come on. Come on. Surrender. <coughs> this morning, surrender to God. Online. As I say every week, type us messages. I'm preaching for your soul this morning. Surrender. Come to Jesus. Today I'd like for us to, if we can, those who are able, just stand everywhere you are.